Bring in show music, please. Hi, I'm CNBC producer Katie Kramer. Today on Squawk Pod. A shakeup coming to compensation for your realtor. Remax President Amy Lessinger on tomorrow's new rules of the road for real estate. The prices are negotiable as are commissions between buyers and sellers. Market price is determined by supply and demand. And this story went on for about, what, five years? And then it was sold? And now it's back in the news. Can it be over? Another Paramount bidder. This time, Edgar Bronfman, the media executive, is getting involved in this very messy merger. Plus, the other big headlines, crypto support for Kamala Harris, and in the volatile world of global tech regulation, a big move for upstart Epic Games. If you ask Apple, this is a privacy nightmare and a virus nightmare. If you ask the EU, it's going to unleash a wave of innovation on the iPhone. It's Friday, finally, August 16th, 2024. Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand Andrew by in three, two, one, cue Andrew. Good morning. Welcome to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We're live at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin along with Melissa Lee and Steve Leisman. Joe and Becky are off today on this Friday morning. Former President Donald Trump releasing a personal financial disclosure form yesterday as required by federal election laws. It reveals that Trump received $513 million in income from his U.S. resort and residential properties, including his golf clubs. Trump also has a sizable position in cryptocurrency. That includes a crypto wallet and virtual Ethereum key that he values at $1 to $5 million. The form also reveals that Trump has made $300,000 on branded Bibles. They're called Greenwood Bibles, selling for about $60 that include a handwritten uh, chorus to the song God Bless the USA by country singer Lee Greenwood. A limited edition copy of that Bible bearing Trump signatures listed on Trump's website. You can buy it for $1,000. So... I don't know. Are we, when are we going to get the tax? Are we ever getting the tax forms? Remember the tax uh, yeah, forms? Yeah, I would think eventually we would. Would we? I thought that. Uh, I thought I that the, kind of think they most of them got out, didn't the, they? Uh, the well, oh, they 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 the old ones. On this. The old ones. No, Wait, would you get you, the which ones? Would like you get the, the newest tax forms for twenty three? Yeah, would you get 22? the most? I would think you would. I don't think you ever really. You ever never got them while he was the president. Remember there was a, he, he would always say Aren't we over that he would Isn't always that say another sort of Trumpism that's been normalized at this point. Well, I don't know. He's not do, giving us the tax. Do you want the tax forms from Harris? Sure. I would like to see yes. the tax yes, forms from absolutely. Harris. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So you'd like to see the tax forms from Trump. Right. But you know, where are you going to spend What he wants your, and what he gets are two different things. Where are you going to so spend true. your time <laughs> bagging your head against the wall? Speaking of banging your head against the wall, um, let's get to Paramount. <laughs> Media executive Edgar Bronfen Jr. is preparing a bid for Paramount Global and National Amusements. That's according to a Wall Street Journal report. Bronfen formerly ran Warner Music and liquor giant Seagram. He has held discussions with potential backers, including Hollywood producer Stephen Paul, and companies including Fortress Investment Group and streaming device maker Roku. The word of a potential bid comes more than a month after Sherry Redstone agreed to sell her media empire to David Ellison's Skydance Media. That deal is subject to a go shop period until Wednesday of next week, so Ellison would have the right to counter any incoming bids. And so the story goes on. The story goes on. It's interesting. You know, Barry Diller said that he suspected, I don't know if you remember uh, when we were in Paris, he said, look, I think he had taken a look at it. He said he was out, mm-hmm. um, but suggested that it would be very difficult for somebody else to come in because you have to pay the breakup 400 fee. $400 million. You have to pay the $400 million right. breakup fee. And then it's not just that. It's also, depending on what kind of extra investment you may have to make over time. I mean, I don't think anyone thinks that, you know, all is clear here. So it's not just the investment you're buying into the business. You might actually have to put up additional capital at some other point I, in I, life. My attitude was just, you know, this story went on for about, what, five years? And then it was sold? And now it's back in the news. Can it be over? Well, kind of it will be. <laughs> by the way, in a couple of weeks, it will be. It's also unclear, by the way, whether Sherry Redstone would agree to a different deal with a different person, I mean, too. So there's a whole, think it's of the not steps. so easy for she a She has special. to agree. It's not even just the, just the no, highest it's, bid. It's, it has to be. Well, right. And then there's right. a matching right. Um, there's a special committee. They could look at the two bids and look at them differently. There's lots of different Paramount components. could do a 20-episode you know, series mm-hmm. on Paramount. I don't think it would help stem their losses, though, if they ran that series on Paramount+. Plus. I don't know if it's that interesting a story, but it has <laughs> certainly been out there forever. Let's talk a little bit about retail stocks. After yesterday, Walmart is now the best performing retailer in the S&P 500 this year. 
It is now outpacing the gains of uh, Costco, which was its nearest rival in this race here. So it's up 38 percent after yesterday's uh, earnings lifted the stock by about 6 percent. And there you see uh, Walmart really taking on the lead there. And, it, you know, there's that ongoing debate, Steve. Does Walmart indicate that the consumer is strong or does it indicate that the consumer is actually under duress and has to go to Walmart increasingly to make their dollars stretch? Yeah, that's your McDonald's question. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could offer a third possibility or that Walmart sure. has taken share from yes. others and we get the other retailers, could, I think. it could think. be a combination of the Well, that's of, why the retailers next week, I think, will be very important. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's what we'll get. Those, I think it's Target coming Target, out next yep. week at all, and we'll see those. Um, I think, as I said earlier this week, the rumors of the consumer's death have been greatly, greatly exaggerated. exaggerated. I yeah. think they're under a little more pressure mm -hmm. because the savings have run down, but we still have decent incomes, and this whole notion of incomes... Uh, or salaries being higher than inflation. Real incomes, real wages have been rising for a pretty good streak now. So that should help consumer spending and bring everything back down to normal. I think there's also this interesting shift that you want to be aware of. We were all into goods, then we're all into services, and maybe now there's a shift back to a better balance, balance. of goods and services. Goods are transparent to the goods purchases are transparent to the market because there's more public companies that do it. Right. The services there aren't right. that many public companies, so we don't really know what what's going on. However, my big argument with our economic data set in this country is services are two thirds of consumer spending, and we have like one bad late series to measure services. Right. We're really good, as I, as I like to say, we have a great set of economic data. For measuring the economy in 1952, right, right, it, and yeah. and it never. I mean, I know they're trying, but but we could do a much better job. It's sort of like the, the Dow out. theory concept being right. outdated. Exactly, the same sort of notion. Our economy has changed. It's changed. Yeah. Food and Drug Administration laying out fresh goals to cut sodium levels in packaged and processed foods by about 20%. It's an effort to address a growing epidemic of diet-related chronic diseases. The agency saying new guidelines to trim sodium levels that. Uh, were set back in 2021, showed early signs of success. It says 40% of food categories achieved the first phase of those sodium targets, which included cutting levels by an average of about 12%. It's now seeking voluntary curbs from packaged good food makers such as PepsiCo, Kraft Heinz, and all right, Campbell's I'll Soup. Bite. I'm in Joe's seat. Should the yep. government be doing this at all, Andrew? I don't know. As we know. Well, come on. We, we yes or no? I, I'm very conflicted, and I have mixed views about it because we there have been periods of time. We remember where we thought like pasta was great, carbs were great for you, fat mm -hmm. was terrible for you. Now we know that fat is better for you than carbs, and maybe eight, ten years from now people will you turn around. You think all of a sudden sodium is going to be good for you? I think sodium not being good for you has sodium weathered is, the test of sodium time. Sodium is probably not great for you, but the, you have to have some electrolytes in your of system. Of course, but they're not saying eliminate. No, they're missing, saying reduce it. I feel like like, no, he's going to the like larger point, which is whether the government should be doing it at all. Right. Can't, my, my argument is always the government should do it if the market can't do it. So I would ask the question, why isn't the market solving for a problem of too much sodium in the food? I'll give you an answer. Yeah. People don't read labels. No, it's not about that. Go ahead. As long as, so this goes to the free market, not free market. Sure. As long as we're providing uh, Medicare and Medicaid services. Oh, yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. as, long as, as long as taxpayers have decided to pay for everybody's health care, we all have a vested interest in everybody's health. But that's that not responsive, is, Andrew. It is. That's not responsive. What do you mean it's not responsive? Having a vested interest does not explain a market failure. No, just no, because, he, just but be, you're saying that just, that's right. why we're, we're we should say other. yes. The government. I'm saying that we should care we're about should the, care. We have a vested interest Fine. in this issue as a I taxpayer. Agree. As a, we are all shareholders because of the sure, way I we've agree. set up our healthcare system, for better or worse. We don't really have no, a free no, no. market healthcare system. Agreed. We are shareholders Agreed. in each other's health. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yes. We, we don't disagree. For better so or worse. Therefore, we have a right, the government, to try and. You have more of a vote in everybody's health than you think you do. It seems to me that the government has a role in talking about the dangers of sodium. Yes. To which consumers should respond with their preferences well, well, and should, companies can I, can should I, respond to consumer preferences. Should they though? And then there is well, no need for a government why, regulation. Why can't we intervene here on these sorts of issues before we get to a point where we're going to cover through Medicare obesity pills, obesity treatments? Mm -hmm. So you're saying because the government covers the obesity treatments, we we should have a role I'm in just saying that we should be preventive but we should be preventive 
in health care issues. My argument is more nuanced than that, and maybe I'm not making myself You're saying clear. why is the market not dealing not with this? Not responding. Government says sodium bad. Right. Consumer preference. Company respond to consumer preference. No need for government regulation Correct. about sodium. Correct. Because That's consumer, my argument. Because consumers want to kill themselves. We all are trying no, to kill I, ourselves. I, I also think part of it is In our own weird way. We're all price. doing things that we're not supposed to be it, doing. Part of it is price. The lower quality foods rely on things like yes. sodium and sugar to make them more palatable. Oh, and that's if you a don't good have one. a well, choice, that's, that's you don't have a choice to pay more. Okay. Something well, that's now you're about. talking my language, Melissa, because now what you're saying is the market cannot arbitrage for. Well, this, this goes to high, like high fructose uh, in foods. This goes to cheaper foods at, at yes. fast food chains and the like, right. rather than fruit. Yeah, whole okay. foods, which are more right. expensive. All right. There's, there's, there's there an argument to be made about that, but that's on the margins, I think. There is, I, I, I think that's, that's the key the right there. I that's, think that, that is that's the key. a bag of French Why fries that have all the sodium. That is going to be a lot cheaper than even going to McDonald's. Right. There's something about sitting in this chair that makes me ask those questions. It's really? Not, it's not Joe's political point of view. It's the chair. Wow. It's the chair. Cheese will be next. Still to come, realtors are getting ready for a game change when it comes to their commissions. Remax President Amy Lessinger explains the shift heading to the neighborhood. Being represented by a professional and trusted agent is important for both buyers and sellers. Squawk Pod will be right back. Welcome back to Squawk Pod. This weekend, a stunning shift going into effect in the world of real estate that will impact how brokers are paid and will have real impact for home buyers as well. For decades, if you were selling a home, you paid one fee to an agent, a few percentage of the sale price. And that agent typically split the fee with the agent representing the buyer. Well, the National Association of Realtors, or NAR, reached a legal settlement this spring that puts in new rules on the way these transactions work and how they are talked about online, the multiple listing services the industry uses to list homes. Andrew, Melissa, and Steve dug into this generational change. CNBC real estate reporter Diana Olick starts things off. This is really a landmark antitrust settlement in the housing market that will fundamentally change the way real estate agents are compensated when you buy or sell your home. The National Association of Realtors agreed to take offers of broker compensation off the MLS. That's the listing database that they use. In addition, buyers will have to sign agreements of compensation with their agents. In the past, both buyer and seller agent commissions were usually paid by the seller. Now the seller doesn't have to, and some say this could lower lower agent commissions and maybe even lower home prices. Okay. Uh, Diana, stick around for more. I want to uh, bring in Amy Lessinger, president of Remax. Good morning to you. Uh, what do you think? Good morning. What, How are what you? is this really going to do starting tomorrow? Listen, as you just heard, there's a couple of changes. First of all, offers of compensation are still allowed. They just aren't going to be communicated via the MLS. And then, of course, a written buyer representation agreement will be signed between the buyer and the agent prior to showing property. You know, what's interesting about this is the fact that, you know, buyer agency has been around since the 90s in the U.S. and 20 of the 50 states, these written buyer agreements, they've all already been required. However, in the other 30, the agreements have been widely used. They just weren't required. What's the unintended consequence of this that we're not thinking about? You know, I think that actually this shines a light on why being represented by a professional and trusted agent is important for both buyers and sellers. Making sure that your, your interests are represented in the transaction and that you have a transparent conversation about compensation is critical. Diana? And Amy, I'm just curious, there's been a lot of talk about the first time buyer who really relies on an agent because they may not understand the process of buying a home, you know, appraisals and assessments, contingencies, all those things. If the buyer can't afford to pay for their own agent and they choose not to, is that going to be, you know, a problem for first time buyers coming in? I think that's where a professional agent can step in and help a buyer navigate. As we know, commissions are always negotiable. And what was possible pre-settlement is still possible post-settlement. But I do think that buyers need to rely on professional expertise so that they can walk through that process and understand what does happen and what is the buyer's directive if a seller is not offering compensation. So can I go to the broker and say I'll pay you 2%? 
Commissions are negotiable and always have been. And the broker can decide not to take my business if, Look, if I'm offering too agent, little. Agents provide a very valuable service and they deserve to be compensated. It is up to them to articulate their value, determine right. what they charge for their services, and of course, it's up to the seller and or the buyer as to whether or not they want to pay right. their commission. Amy, how long am I locked in to a particular agent or, or broker, if you will? Meaning, I sign up with you, I say, Let's, we're gonna go look for properties, we look for a bunch of properties, I don't decide I want said properties, or I don't want them at those prices. I don't know, six months pass, something else happens in my life, I then wanna actually go back, and oh, all of a sudden one of the properties is lower. Um, can I go back without that agent? Am I locked in for two years? What's going on here? Ultimately, buyers need to ask these questions, and a quality agent will explain timeline, what the terms and the scope of the agreement are, in order to help a buyer make that best decision about how long the agreement should be, what the scope of services are, and the compensation that's being offered. Amy, do you buy this argument that it will actually lower home prices because if the seller doesn't have to pay for the buyer agent commission, that they might take that off the home price? Great question. Look, the price of property is determined by supply and demand. And foundationally, there are benefits to a seller for having a represented party on the other side. Just like for buyers, it's important for sellers that they hire a trusted professional who can walk them through what are the advantages of having someone represented on the other side, helping them navigate the complexities of the transaction, making sure their interests are being represented, and it, it can really smooth a transaction over. I've been an agent and a broker for almost 30 years. I recently moved and relocated. I hired a professional agent because that local expertise, that knowledge but will the is incredibly come important. But down, Amy, if you're no longer paying two and a half if you're the seller and you're not paying two and a half percent to the buyer's agent anymore because that's being picked up by the buyer, does that price, I mean, where does that money go? I think the prices are negotiable as are commissions between buyers and sellers. Market price is determined by supply and demand, what a buyer is willing to pay and what a seller is willing to accept. Amy, I did a story in my first job out of college for the Sarasota Herald Tribune was I was a real estate reporter. Should you ha hire a buyer's agent? And there was a lot of reasons for people to do that, especially uh, in the real crazy real estate market that was Florida back in the late 80s. So I think that's some good advice anyway. I agree. Being represented by a trusted professional is critically important. And they can walk buyers and sellers through these changes, what they mean, and how their interests are represented in the transaction. Okay. Uh, Amy, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks Diana, for thank having you me. as well. You bet. Up next on Squawk Pod, the other stories that got us talking, like Epic Games rolling out a new app store, taking Apple head on in Europe, and crypto support for Kamala Harris. Not just that they're contributing, it's what they're going for. Yep. And how that's going to shape legislation in the future. Shape by legislation. Why donors are donating right after this. You're listening to Squawk Pod from CNBC. And before we wrap today's episode, a few more stories that got us squawking. I love this story. The future of crypto regulation is just one of many issues on the campaign trail and support from the industry is rolling in. Emily Wilkins joins us now with more. Emily, good morning. Morning, Steve. Well, yeah, Democrats were now seen cozying up to crypto, and a major crypto pack is returning the love. Fair Shake Pack, which is backed by Coinbase, Ripple, Anderson Horowitz, they announced they will spend $6 million on ad buys in two, for two Democrats in key Senate races. You got Ruben Gallego in Arizona, and then Alyssa Slotkin in Michigan, so $3 million for each of them. The announcement came shortly before Slotkin and other Democrats uh, joined on a Crypto for Harris call, had about a thousand folks on it, and they vowed to pass regulations that would provide clarity, stability, and a path for the industry to grow. Now, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer was also on the call, and he said it was his goal to pass a crypto bill by the year's end. A couple bills out there, but the one Schumer mentioned is a bill from Senator Debbie Stabenow that would establish clear rules of the road for creating crypto tokens. Exchanges, brokers, and dealers would need to register with the CFTC on this bill, and the CFTC FTC would have the power to protect consumers. 
Now, crypto groups are not leaving Republicans behind. They say they want to strike a bipartisan balance to be able to actually move through legislation. Fair Shake also announced that they're going to be pouring $25 million into 18 House races, and they're evenly split. Nine of them are Democrats, nine of them are Republicans. They're also going to be putting $12 million into ads backing Republican Bernie Moreno. He is challenging Ohio Democrat Sherrod Brown, and Brown, of course, chairs the Banking Committee in the Senate, and so far, he's been unwilling to engage on crypto legislation. Guys? Okay, I am not going to ask the dumb question of do they make their contribution in crypto. I'm going to ask another question. Um, I think that's a good question. It's a good question. Although they probably don't. Do, what, do they, it's Emily? Not, it's not a bad question. It, I mean, what? you guys noted Donald Trump's holding more than one million in crypto right now. It's it's, um, but 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 I, if you if you have something else you want to pick, uh, ask about Steve. All all ears, happy to go wherever you want. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that in a second. What do they want, really? I mean, do they just want stability and protection for the consumer, or is there something else that are they are they playing an action of? don't hurt us or is there something else that they want in terms of trying to get i don't know crypto um uh become part of, become a, a more common currency out there are they trying to keep the central bank from issuing a digital currency w w what's the end game here for crypto no, no, it's Steve. It's a great question. And I think to a certain extent, a lot of different things, right? I mean, Schumer on the call compared it a little bit to AI. He said, we need to give them some rules of the road so that investors feel comfortable, so that people using the technology feel comfortable, so that we know that consumers aren't going to be hurt. But we also need to make sure that those restrictions aren't such that you're actually blocking innovation. And of course, a lot of these crypto groups, they've been on Capitol Hill, they've been meeting with Schumer, other Democrats, other Republicans, really Really trying to make some progress. And you've seen that this year. You saw the House pass that major crypto regulatory bill, uh, giving power to the SEC and the CFTC. And now you're seeing the Senate try to do something similar. So I think for a lot of these crypto groups, they see sort of as having some base regulation, a base foundation for sort of what the rules of the road are. They're hoping that that inspires more confidence in consumers uh, and more use of crypto. And, and are the contributions in crypto? I don't believe the contributions are in crypto okay. at this time. Emily, thank you but very much. But that could change if we get some of these regulations. Thanks. Thanks, Emily Wilkins. I just want to say Emily's coverage of this nexus between money and politics is a reason you should be watching yep. CNBC. Mm -hmm. There you go. Because you know what, they, what, they, what they're after. You do. Not just that they're contributing. It's what they're going for. Yep. And how that's going to shape legislation in the future. Shape by legislation. Shape. By. By. Shape is a euphemism, mm -hmm. perhaps. Buying, <laughs> right? We've, we've That's the cynical. Forming, Le creating. Legalized bribery. Forming, creating, guiding. Uh, Epic Games, maker of Fortnite, just out with some breaking news. And Steve Kovac is at the table this morning to tell us about it. What's going on? Yeah, this is an important one, Andrew, because Epic Games, they're launching their first app store on iPhone and Android today. This is only happening in the European Union, but it's really interesting because you have Epic Games, one of the chief antagonists of Apple, challenging Apple on its own turf on the iPhone, competing directly with the App Store for gaming. Now, gaming is the most lucrative part of the App Store business. It's about 70% of revenues there. And this is all possible because of the EU's Digital Markets Act, which went into uh, full enforcement earlier this spring. And it forces Apple in part to allow third-party app stores on the iPhone for the very first time. But the European Commission says Apple is likely not complying fully with the DMA yet. Their problem with what uh, Apple's been doing is Apple is still collecting some fees on these third party app stores, though those fees are a little bit less than they were before. Now, Epic says despite those fees, it is going to be launching the store anyway on a call uh, with uh, CNBC CEO Tim Sweeney told us he said the fight is, quote, far from over. They're still going to be pushing the EC to push Apple to lower those fees. Epic's goal, though, at least in the nearer term, is 100 million installs of this new store across iPhone and Android. And starting with its own games at first, just a few of them, uh, that includes Fortnite returning to the iPhone, famously got kicked off the iPhone back in 2020. Uh, and it wants to eventually offer more games. But again, this is just in the EU, in the United States. They lost their case against Apple uh, for this, so it's going to be a while. But 
The DOJ's antitrust case against Apple overlaps many of those DMA uh, regulations, and that could be Epic's best hope in the U.S. to do something similar. But this is really interesting seeing that wall garden come down and a chief antagonist really go after Apple on its own turf. Do you think they can hit these numbers? It would be surprising. So one thing that they point out, uh, Epic Games, is the install process. You have to go through like a dozen screens, warning, they call them scare screens, meaning like if you install this, it might hurt your privacy, it opens up to malware yeah. and so on and so forth. So they see that as a barrier, first of all, not just the fees, but this whole process the user has to go through just to get the store on there. So it's going to be tough. It's tougher to do it than just, you know, installing an app. So maybe, maybe not. What's it look like? Have you tried? I, don't know. I can't, I can't conceive of it. what another store looks like. It looks like an app store, but this one is focused on gaming. And again, this is Epic Games does a very similar kind of store on PCs and Macs. They're, they sell PC games. Uh -huh. uh, they have, it's, it think of it as an app store for like PC store. games. Yeah, it looks just like a just store. It looks like the app store. Yeah. Oh, it's another icon. It's another icon on the Oh, your I see. Screen. So you don't go into the App Store and then find Epic. You Correct. Get it. You go to the Epic Correct. Store. And no the Apple. Epic Store. There's no then, Apple involved here. Yeah. There's no Apple involved. And then once you hit it, you click on the thing you want, and that's how. And it there's goes. there's another barrier here too, besides just the the wonky process you have to go through. It's um, when I was on this call with the Epic CEO uh, a couple days ago, and they were saying the. Uh, the approval process for even just apps in these alternate stores, they said it's been taking them up to 30 days to get those apps just approved. They're supposed to look for things like malware and things like that, uh, but it seems to be taking a longer process to get this done. So Apple is really you know, pumping the brakes every way they can in, with these well, regulations. Well, does Apple have liability here? I mean, if you go and install a game in there and it ruins your iPhone or somehow... That's what Apple thinks could happen. Is that legitimate? Uh, Potentially, we don't know. If you ask yeah. Apple, this is a privacy nightmare and a mal virus nightmare, and you know people's phones are going to be flooded with viruses and so forth. If you ask the EU, it's going to unleash uh, a wave of innovation on the iPhone that we've never seen before. Right. It's only been a few months. So Neither Apple's of those is, have happened yet. The truth is, Apple is basically saying, "Look, when you and we've talked about this, when yeah. you buy this phone, you you're buying into not just the hardware, you're buying right. into the whole ecosystem. Playing our sandbox. Life, it's it's, mm -hmm. it's a structure." And that's what you want. And the EU and so is the, the breaking down that you, structure. And the EU is breaking down that structure. And so the second you have other people building their own stores and doing all sorts of crazy things could happen or not. And they're trying either, you talked about it as being sl slowing it down. Yeah. Or, 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 and new fees too. Or maybe they're trying to be careful though. It, it, you I mean, could see it both ways. I mean, obviously right? Apple. And then there's the cost of actually, by the way, to monitor all this stuff, you have to have more people Correct. physically doing all of these things. So it actually does take time. Yeah, there is I an I do have some process. sympathy to this. Situation. I mean, it, it does open up in a way that it hasn't happened before, and I do understand why they would want to be careful with the approval process and warning users that, hey, this could happen, this opens up your phone right. in a way it hasn't. And that's to prevent the liability issues. That could be to prevent the liability. Right. Because effectively, also, you're, accept, you're accepting, all, if they show you a hundred times, I, if I you do this, I would always Andrew, on the following way. Is it any more cost to them to approve a game or to scrutinize a game inside of the Epic Store compared to inside of the regular Apple Store? That I don't know. And I don't it think, like I don't think they the need to hire necessarily a ton of more people. I, I really don't know the answer to that, but they do have to approve the store. They do have to approve the apps that go into those third-party stores. Not in the same way they approve them for uh, the regular App Store. For example, pornography would be allowed in these third-party stores. That's not allowed in the Apple App Store. So right. they're, you know, Ooh, if there's- that's interesting. So if someone wants to put a pornography store, right. in theory, Oh, it's, I'm they sure could. it's happening as we I'm speak. I'm sure someone's How much more that. money does Epic make now? How much, well, yeah. oh, we, well, we don't know. The, the, the fees are less, right. but it's not, I mean, if you ask Epic, they'd want zero fees, but I mean, that's never gonna happen. Uh, but what the EC is having problems with Apple is, you know, they say, we'll take away these fees or we'll lower these fees, but we'll find other fees to charge you. Because like I said, gaming is the most lucrative part of the app store, up to 70% of revenues. They want to protect that revenue source. Services is right. a huge part of their business. Yeah. This is a threat to that. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. That's the pod for today and for the week. Thanks for tuning in. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Tune in weekday mornings on CNBC at 6 Eastern to get the smartest takes and analysis from our three-hour TV show right into your ears. Follow this podcast, follow Squawk Pod wherever you like to listen. We'll meet you back here on Monday. Have a great weekend. 
And we are clear. Thanks, guys.